Good morning, and welcome back to the basement. So I love this 1941 South Bend lathe. I love its history. I love this cabinet that it sits on. This was delivered to the U.S. Air Force. It was manufactured in December of 1941, delivered in January of 1942. So, I mean, what a momentous time in our nation's history. And it has a placard over here that says, this machine conforms to the orders of the War Production Board. So it's up to spec to be used in a war environment. From my research, I think this is the original cabinet that the lathe was shipped with. Special order from South Bend. This is a hardwood top. And I think that this went into a mobile machine shop, either the back of a deuce and a half or more likely the back of a semi-tractor trailer kind of a thing that was a mobile machine shop. In any case, today we're here to talk about these dials. So this South Bend lathe has what's known as the small dials, which is to say that the graduated indicator dials for the cross slide and for the compound are tiny. My eyesight's not too bad. I can use the dials as they are. The problem is that it's so finicky. There is so little movement represented between these two lines that sometimes it can be pretty hard to kind of stop where you want to stop. So I've thought about there's a modification you can make where you can install larger dials but before you install larger dials you have to first have a longer lead screw. This part currently can retract all the way back over the top of the dial but with a larger dial it can't do that anymore. So then you have to have a longer lead screw and it's, it's a big involved thing. But I have a silly idea for making a set of larger dials that simply clamp on here. And for those times that you need the full travel of this cross slide, then you could simply remove the dial and do your work. And when you're done, put the dial back on. So I'll be making it out of these uh, flanges. These are out of a treadmill. These went between a, a piece of pipe and, you know, was one of the roller ends of the belt that the treadmill is on. And they're about the right outer diameter. So all I have to do is skin it to a final diameter and then bore it to the exact inner diameter and then make a way to attach it. So along the way, we'll be doing some indexing in the lathe chuck. We'll be doing some stamping to stamp the numbers on. And so I hope you enjoy the journey. So the first thing we need to do, which I did off camera, is make a mandrel on which to turn these flanges. So I made it a pretty tight fit. I'll actually probably have to walk over to the press to press it in place, or to the vise anyway. And all this is is kind of a tight interference fit to go into the inner race of this flange. And then this piece will mount into the three jaw and do our thing. So I'll go press this on, on in the vise. Bit of lard for some lubrication. The other flange had a pulley groove cut in it. And I've already turned it down and I had to turn it farther than just a skim cut. So the other one is 1.732. So we need to take this one down to meet because they will have a, an indicator line that lines up. 1.864, so we have 100 to go. That'll work. I am creating larger graduated dials for this lathe, and then I'm going to be graduating this, uh, giving it 100 you know, marks around the perimeter. So I need to index it 100 times, and what I'm about to do is take this piece of paper and measure the precise circumference of this chuck. Once I know its precise circumference, then I can simply go to my CAD program and divide this distance by 100 and just print out a series of lines on my printer that are that distance apart. So now in my CAD program, I have drawn a line that's 19.785 high 
and I have placed 99 division points within it. And I will print these out, being sure to print them at 100% scale. And here it is. This is the, the transition. You can see that it's lined up, well, certainly within a couple thousandths. And when you back out the error of a couple thousandths of an inch out here, down into here, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. So I took this cover off and cut this piece of sheet metal. And then I went ahead and took this uh, little bit heavier gauge flat steel. So it's acting as a spindle lock. You know, it's tight here. And when I tighten this, then the spindle can't move. We're also increasing our precision of using this paper-based indexing method by use of a USB bore scope. And then over here in the laptop, we have the display from the USB microscope. So we can have a lot of confidence that we are right on the line. And here we have the full setup. We're using this boring bar. The boring bar intentionally provides a little bit of springiness, a little bit of flexibility, so that I can push it farther in than it ought to be able to go, because I'll get a little spring here. And then where we are pulling away from the chuck, creating a scribe. You can see the bit here, the bit is very sharp. It's, you know, I have it in here at an angle where it's got plenty of rake in both directions. So each stroke will be come back to the stop, dial in the cross slide, stroke across, move a line using the naked eye, tap it into place using the webcam, and bring the scriber head in and do three strokes. So there's that line, and then move on to the next. So the carriage stop gives me nice, consistent, repeatable line length. The cross slide gives me a nice, consistent tool pressure. And the indexing printout tape gives me a nice, consistent 100 graduations. Using this setup, it does take a little longer than if I had something mechanical like uh, Mr. Pete does where he just used a saw blade and click, 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 and that's really fast. This is a little slower because for each line, I have to manually adjust to the line. But the cool part is it's pretty much infinitely adjustable as long as you can print out the tape with the indexing marks that you need, then you can index any number. This is gonna be my method to go through and make my 100 index marks on this that's going to be the dial. So here it is after all the lines along with the major and minor graduations have all been scribed. Major lines every 10 and then minor lines every 5 and between those which is actually every 10 just clocked by 5. So all I have to do now is stamp the numbers on there. For stamping the numbers in to get it accurate, we're going to be building a jig to put in the drill press. Something that will hold the number stamp in position and perfectly vertical and in its relative position to the part that we're stamping. And then to actually strike it, we're going to take one of these weights and we're going to do something akin to a slide hammer. The way this is going to work is this piece will be vertical it'll be holding the number stamp and this weight here will be allowed to drop down the shaft slam into the collar and drive the number down into the work so I've just finished milling a slot in this piece of one inch bar that is just big enough to kind of tightly hold one of these stamps so now I'm going to cross drill through here so that I can pin this collar in place. So a little progress update. I put this in the drill press and drilled and tapped a new set screw over here. This is the original set screw. I cranked it in tight till it left a mark and then drilled at the mark. So what I'm going to do now is arrange this on here so that this is bearing into that hole and then crank this tight so that it leaves a mark and then go drill the other hole. You know, we're just drilling a dimple. We want this bolt to kind of engage, you know, interference into the shaft, but we don't actually want it to sink deep into the shaft because we want it to be a tight fit, not a sloppy one. So now I have 
what is in effect a punch with a number stamp on the end. I could smack it here with a hammer and it would stamp that number. Or I can put a weight to drop down that shaft. So now we'll take this apart and bore out this center to one inch if it's not already there so that it can slide up and down on that shaft. All right, so I took a little test marking dropping the weight down the shaft and I didn't get a very deep mark. So I think I need all the travel I can get for the weight to accelerate. So if I nestle the dial in this crack and I want, of course, the thing to be controlled by the spindle. So it looks to me like I have a maximum, leaving a little room to get the spindle in there. It looks like I need about 14 inches for the total length of the system to the cut down point where it enters the collet. That will give me the maximum acceleration of that weight. All right, so we're ready to give this thing a test. I have the zero stamp chucked up here in the holder. And this center slot will act as a self-centering, uh, kind of an anvil. The round part that we're stamping isn't gonna wanna go anywhere because it's down in this slot. The edge of the vise here is gonna act as a backstop to get a consistent depth. So I'll get it adjusted when the time comes to where I'm putting the stamp in the proper place. Bring the quill down, hold pressure, Take the weight up and drop it. And there it left a very nice little zero. I think that's going to work wonderfully. So all I have to do now is work out a consistent way to get the stamp to be adjacent to the line that it's indicating so that my kerning of my characters looks nice. Obviously, I'll step all the way around and do all the zeros. There will be 10 of those, and those I can be pretty consistent. So I'm going to make some kind of a little pointer to tell me where to rotate the part to to get a consistent result. And then repeat that 10 different times with the zeros, and then I just have to go back and do the one, two, threes. All right, so I now have the zero lined up in here. So bring the head down, hold pressure. And there is a nice clean zero mark. That should work beautiful. So this piece, after I finished engraving all the lines and stamping the numbers, I painted it black and I have it mounted up in the chuck again. And we will just skim it to clean up to a shiny metal color and leave the black digits and lines behind. All right, so that's close enough there as far as knocking down actual metal. And there it is. Now all we have to do is make these fit onto here. I am now boring out this hole to 1.252. Just doing a rough measurement here, so 1.135. My little lube. I use lard as a lube because it doesn't stink too badly. And since I'm in the basement, I can stink up the whole house if I use something that's real acrid, real aromatic. Take off 20. 1.150. We're gonna take off 40. Fifty-two. So this would be a very snug fit around this ring and I'll just hold it in place with a set screw and we'll bore out the next one. Now I flipped it around in the chuck and I'm facing it off to thin it up a little bit. All right, so here it is in its final position. It's not locked down yet. So the last thing I need to do 
is drill and tap both of these rings. This ring I will drill and tap on the very bottom so that it is drawing this part down tight. And then this one I will do, I think you're supposed to do it, I think I do it around 90 or 80, something like that. Put a thumb screw here so that this can be adjustable. And voila, it will be a large dial conversion. And if I really, really need that extra inch of travel, I'm also going to make a thumb screw version of this screw here. So that I can just remove this, pull the ball crank, and then both of these can come off. Alright, so digging through my stock of shoulder bolts, I have found these brass thumb screws already made. I don't have to do a thing to them. And of course, because they're brass, they're not going to scar up those surfaces. If I was going to use a steel thumb screw, I'd have to give it a brass plug insert so that I don't scar up that underneath surface. But these will be perfect just as they are. Looks like that's probably an 832. So I'll drill and tap for 832. Voila. So I want to minimize the protrusion of the screw head. So I'm going to use my electrical pliers and cut off about six threads off the end of this. These uh, kind of pliers have a screw cutter built in. So I'm going to thread this into the one that says 8-32. And then from over here I can just look at the protrusion until it has six threads. So two, four, that's like right at the six mark. So just clip it and then screw it out and I'll just touch this to the sander just to clean the end of it up and now I have to screw it almost all the way in so that will minimize how far out this is sticking making a replacement nut to hold the handle on so that I can remove it easily so I have just finished uh, used my knurling tool to give this a knurl, I just finished tapping it 1224, and now I will part it off, and that will be my piece. And there it is. It now has large dials installed, and if you need to take it off, you can just remove this thumb screw, pull the handle, loosen that up and pull the large dial off if you really need that extra travel. But most of the time you can leave it on and keep the handle on there. So there you have it. Large dial accessory add-on on a South Bend lathe. Total cost zero. And hey Thanks for watching.